Assalamu alaikum. Thank you everyone uh, for coming out on a Saturday morning uh, with kind of a little bit overcast. It's been colder than usual than we would expect at this time of year, but at least we don't have the inches of snow that they have up in the Northeast. I know it's hard to get up, arrange for schedules and children's, but we really want to thank everyone for, for coming out. Um, we're really excited to uh, be here and have this program, and um, it really makes me think about um, what the ISB Atlanta is and does for the community here in Atlanta, the Muslim community, and the non-Muslim community, the community at large. ISB is probably one of the uh, worst legacy names for an organization I can think of. But it's a good name. So it's the Islamic Speakers Bureau. Um, but if you think about speaking and what that really entails, it's so much more than just talking, right? It's not the Islamic Talkers Bureau for a reason. Because to speak, it's about ideas. It's about leadership. It's about action. Talkers talk. Speakers lead by example. And that's why the ISP Atlanta is such an exciting organization because not only is it the training ground for speakers by default, it's the training ground for leaders in the community. If we think about the leaders of, at various mosques, at the various organizations in Atlanta, so many of them have been involved in ISV programs or have been trained as speakers or are close partners of the ISB. The ISB is the leadership training organization for the Muslim community in Atlanta. And this is a way for us to say thank you and to recognize those leaders that I see here from the Muslim community in Atlanta who have dedicated your lives to growing relationships to making sure that the Muslim community has a strong path and direction forward is a part of the American and Atlantan fabric here. And so I'm really excited to talk about some programs that go along that vein. So there's so much that ISP Atlanta does, but what we realized is so, since so much of it is leadership development, and so much leadership development occurs, and we have such great leaders that are our partners that we recognize that are part of the ISV. We're excited to talk about a leadership institute. The exact name, Sumaya will correct me on what we're gonna call it, but it's going to be an Atlanta Muslim Leadership Institute, which is going to serve as a source of mentorship and leadership training for the next generation of Atlanta Muslim leaders. And is a model which I think will be really welcome not only in the Atlanta metro area, but the rest of Georgia and around the country. And for that, we're planning on partnering with you all. We need your help. We need anybody who is interested or willing to be a trainer for the next generation of Muslim leaders in Atlanta to talk to us and say, this is a role that I could play. What are things that you can offer? Leadership training makes a difference. I've seen it in young people's careers. Things like negotiation skills. Things like how to make an elevator pitch. When you only have 30 seconds with some important audience and you're literally in the elevator, how do you get everything out in that 30 seconds and make sure they understand exactly what you're all about. Things about dealing with strategic planning, funding, relationship building, partnerships. This is not the kind of thing you can learn in books. It's not the kind of stuff that you can learn even if the best MBA programs, it requires mentorship, it requires training, it requires learning from others' experiences. So this Georgia Muslim Leadership Initiative 
Uh, we've identified a curriculum that's been well developed. Uh, we're looking for your help um, to give us your advice. We want to hear from you about what should be a part of this leadership program, and we plan on rolling it out and officially announcing it. But uh, consider this a, a uh, sneak preview of plans to come. We're also excited. Please mark two dates. One is April 28th. Here nearby at the Cedar Grill, uh, we plan on having a small, intimate fundraising event. And on November 10th, we plan on having our gala that we always have every year. And so it's a natural question, why both? Why April 28th and November 10th, five or six months apart? So you all know that at an event like the gala, <clears throat> we can highlight a lot of our programs, we have a wonderful time, but we've been very purposeful and deliberate and intentional, intentional about making sure it's an opportunity for people to come, to support the ISB, but also for everyone to feel welcome, our partners, our allies, our own community members, to feel like they really understand or are welcome at the ISB. There's really no strings attached. You've never heard anybody at the ISB gala say, lock the doors, hold the biryani, who's going to give me $20,000, right? And then silence and guilt tripping uh, until we get that, you know, support. So that's not what's going to happen at Cedar Grill either. But it's going to be an opportunity for us to really invite our best partners to really give you more detail, to have a back and forth about where we're going, our plans, and exactly um, what we need support for. And then we'll lock the door and we'll, we'll hold the, uh, it won't be for Yanni, but it'll be something just as good, right? So, um, so please mark those dates, November 10th and April 28th. Um, with that, um, I'd like to introduce someone who uh, we all know, uh, Sumaya Khalifa, uh, for, for the next part of her, the introduction of Tiana Rai. Right. <coughs> Beautiful faces early in the morning. Appreciate y'all being here. I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce my friend Kevin Riley. And Kevin, thank you so much for being here so early on a Saturday. I know you don't live too far away from here, but still, it's time for your schedule, so I really appreciate that. So let me tell you a little bit about him. He, of course, needs no introduction. Kevin has been the editor-in-chief of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution since January of 2011. He's a longtime employee in Cox Enterprises, which owns the Journal-Constitution uh, and many other outfits. They also have an automotive arm of the organization. He started his career in 1983 at the Dayton Daily News in Ohio while a student at the University of Dayton. He also writes uh, columns on, Sa on Sunday edition of the Journal Constitution and I know a person in this room that follows you like every uh, T that you don't cross and I that you don't dot and that's Iman Fleeman. He reads the, the Atlanta Journal Constitution from cover to cover. <laughs> During his time in Atlanta, he has led a, a rejuvenation of the AJC with an emphasis on investigative journalism. The newspaper was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2017. His podcast, was, which is a part of the AJC's award-winning breakdown series, is a finalist for the American Bar Association Silver, Silver Gable Award. Kevin has emphasized the AJC dis, uh, digital audience first approach, and I think that was a question that Muhammad asked him when he walked in. He says he asked uh, Kevin, "How do you how do you manage with the digital age?" Um, Kevin was named as one of the Atlanta's 55 most powerful people by the Atlanta Magazine. Uh, Kevin and his wife Tracy, Tracy of 31 years have three children and he is a resident of Roswell, and he tells me he could hear the same birds from his home that we hear here at RCM. Wow. And so Kevin, uh, thank you again so much, and uh, Kevin and I went to Leadership Atlanta, uh, class of 15, the best class ever, and that's how I had the privilege and honor of knowing Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good morning. Um, 
And thank you, uh, Sumaya. She uh, is, a, is a very good friend. And I'm very honored to be here in this place with you. And um, I have a, uh, I guess I, I would just, a little confession to make. Um, so, you know, when Smaya calls you and asks you to do something, if you've ever been on the receiving end of one of those calls, you know how it ends. Um, it ends with you agreeing to do it, uh, no matter what. And uh, so then we had a long talk about, well, Saturday morning, really? I mean, what, what do you want me to talk about? And uh, so what I decided to do because of, I, I had, she gave me a pretty good sense of the type of folks who would come this morning is have a conversation with you about an experience I've had that I really haven't had a chance to talk about that, I, that was very important to me, significant to me, and I actually want to see if I can talk about it effectively and in a way that reaches people. So if you want to sit there and listen to me talk, you've come to the wrong place because throughout this I'm going to be asking you about what you think about this, and what you think about that. And I'm not, you know, I, I know that sometimes people need a little incentive, especially on a Saturday morning if they haven't had a few cups of coffee. So I'm going to, anyone who actually asks a question or makes a point I think is good gets a free copy of this book. And this book is actually by one of the best leadership consultants and uh, people I've ever met, Keith Eigel, who's based here in Atlanta. I, Sumaya knows him. He's with the Leadership Lyceum. And they, the book is very, really outstanding. So a little incentive for participation in case you need it. We are a small group, so there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> um, so let me, let me start by uh, you know, some things before we start. Um, I'm going to talk to you about an experience I had last summer being on a jury. And some of you who may have gotten the email and that Tamaya sent out, I had suggested that you listen to this podcast that I, I participated in at the newspaper. But don't worry, you won't be shamed if you didn't listen. Uh, it, it really wasn't a requirement. I was trying to lure more people into listening it and improving our audience numbers. We have had, between the five episodes, we created over a half million downloads of those episodes. So it's very, it's very popular. And it is something, I don't know if anyone, a dedicated podcast listener in the room? Okay. And, and we have attorneys, so this is going to be fun, right? You, you're going to have to speak up a lot. <laughs> um, it's something we've been doing at the newspaper and is in growing popularity. It's, it, you know, a simple way to understand it, if you're not familiar, is it's like old-fashioned radio shows where it's, a, it's an audio show and we, we do episodes. Um, and so we, we have a, a very experienced legal affairs writer, the guy in this picture with me, Bill Rankin, who, who has taken the lead on this and has done some incredible work. I mean, he, his first series was about an unusual case in South Georgia and ultimately, uh, in part because Bill chose to highlight the case in great detail, a guy was released from prison who'd been sentenced to life. And so we have taken this on as, a, as an organization to, at times, point out difficulties, flaws, or interesting things about the, the legal system. It's very important to me personally because I, I, I have three siblings who are attorneys. My father was a police officer. So the legal, what I know deep down is Nothing is more important in our country than trust of the legal system. And the media plays a big role in helping people understand it. And currently, it is often criticized from high places in our country. And I believe that does horrible damage to one of the most important things about our country. Um, so I, I did, we did the podcast on the jury experience. Now, I will warn you that I'll, I'll play parts of it. Because for someone like me, podcast is great. I mean, I get to listen to myself talk. Oh, it's just wonderful. Um, so, uh, we'll, but, but part of what I'm going to ask you, because what I'm trying to do is, is connect the experiences that I had in the jury room to what they reveal about the challenges of leadership and leadership coming into play. So that's most of what I'm interested in hearing from you and what you see and hear and some of that. I will warn you... Um, you know, this, is a, this was a dull murder case. It is, it is very difficult. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 
the circumstances of the case and they inevitably come up. So, um, I mean, again, depending on your point of view, your experience, sometimes we journalists can be a little bit matter of fact about something so tragic because we experience it every day or we create a little sense of distance so that we can write about it from a, you know, objective or unemotional point of view. But, I mean, this is a story where two young men die uh, very, very brutally. And um, I, I understand if maybe you don't want to visit with those details or, you know, or would not uh, want to spend too much time on them. So feel free if it's too much and you want to take a break or ask for us to take a break or leave or something, don't, don't hesitate. I just don't want to make light of it in any way. So let's start. Um, so the, I won't bore you with all the details, which of course, after sitting through a week's trial, I'm intimate with uh, many of them. But what it really came down to is these two guys pictured at the top here had, uh, through a series of phone calls and other ways, um, this hot, uh, they wanted to buy some, a bunch of marijuana. The exact amount was never entirely clear, but it was in the five to $6,000 range according to the deal that they seemed to have made with these two guys on the bottom. And they end up at a, uh, at a uh, gas station a Valero gas station at I-285 and Donald Lee Hollow Parkway and uh, meet there and then decide to, because it's, that gas station is extremely well lit and busy, they agree to go across the street to make the deal. And then things go, this is a piece of surveillance video that we, that we got at the newspaper from the uh, police department. Um, these are the two guys who are selling, going to sell the marijuana. Uh, it's supposedly in this backpack. And um, they're going to talk to these two guys at the gas station before they go across the street to the Burger King. Uh, the scene at the Burger King once the cops arrive. And the result is this. This guy was the driver in the car. He survives. This guy was in the front passenger seat. He's dead. This guy is in one of the sellers of the marijuana. In other words, in other words this guy's partner, and he's dead. So we have two, two people dead, and one of them is the friend of the guy who's charged with murder. Here's the indictment. Um, you might notice uh, two people dead, but 16 counts. Um, Guy was charged in, in Georgia, and we do have an attorney who might be able to explain this better than I. Uh, in Georgia, you, you, there's a charge called felony murder, and so if you commit a murder while committing a felony, it, that's an additional charge. So it's, it was it was really a lot. So you know, I end up in the case, which is sort of surprising that the editor of the newspaper would end up on a jury, and that's part of what and I. I can answer some questions about that. Part of what I um, uh, dealt with in the podcast, but it was, um, you know, it's a fairly arduous process to end up on a jury. You've probably all gotten a jury summons from time to time, and, and uh, you have to call to see if you, you have to report. If you have to report, you go through a screening process, you end up in a courtroom. Most people who are called don't end up on a jury, but I did. So what I was going to do now is play a few audio clips, if I can make this work. And the first one is one of the oddities, what happened, it wasn't enough that I ended up on the jury. The jury picked me as the foreman of the jury. So listen to this, and then I want to know what you think about it. Hopefully it will play and you'll be able to hear it. <laughs> it did earlier. It is playing, but you're not hearing it. Let me see. Okay, we'll start over. Let me. Hey, 
is walking behind me. She says, I know who should be our foreman. My first thought was, good. They had somehow informally come up with someone. But it turned out Judy was pointing at me. Others in the room said they agreed, although I couldn't tell if it was unanimous. So I said, I'm willing to do it, but don't you think we should discuss it? Judy sort of jokingly said, those in favor? Everyone said, aye. And I said, then you're serious. Everyone said, yes. Here's Judy Bloom explaining why she did that to me. I was certain that that's what was gonna happen, so I, I was the first to speak up. I just was sure that's what it should be. And you have experience dealing with a lot of people and people getting off task and wanting to talk about this or that. I just, I just thought you were the ideal candidate. It was nice to hear that after the trial, but at the time I wasn't feeling anywhere near that confident in my ability to organize this effort. I was tired and I wasn't sure I'd have the energy to do this right, but I also... So, what do you think about that? I mean, have any of you ever had sort of, let's just call it greatness thrust upon them, you know, in the words of Shakespeare, where you were asked to lead and you were, weren't expecting it or unprepared for it? Anybody have an example of that? Or What do you do in that situation? Now, you're going to hear a little bit about what I did, but, but what's your reaction to that? Come on, there's a book in it for the first person who raises their hand. I'll go get the book while you think of a really good point to make. Okay. I think that's a wonderful point. Others? Anyone? It's just terrible that there are things in us which others see which we do not ourselves appreciate. And uh, sometimes uh, 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 it becomes as a challenge to rise to the occasion and harvest in yourself the hidden ability that a person may have which you never really even thought of. And uh, I see that more as a challenge rather than an honor. Uh, it is something that you really have to then dedicate yourself and, and, and harness all the resources that you have within yourself and, without, and around you so that you can then fulfill whatever task is in the same way. Right, so let me, I, I think that's a wonderful point. So let me ask you this. Do you like a leader who is a little reluctant? Or do you like a leader who's completely sure? that they're the right person to lead in this yeah, situation. It's, it's, it's logically, that's, I, that's, the, way, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. That the, someone who's going after leadership, you shouldn't put them in leadership. So <laughs> it, should, it should always be the one that is reluctant and not seeking the leadership at all. Yeah, I wonder about that all the time because at, at all the best leaders I've come across are, there's a, mo there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know if it would be reluctant, certainly modesty, without question, right? A little reluctance, a, 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 uh, a acknowledgement of their uncertainty. And I wonder sometimes if that's what turns us so much against politicians who have to declare affirmatively, openly, aggressively that they want to lead. And when you know you point out this principle which i don't think is you know unique certainly to to this faith but but it's a very human impulse right to god who trusts that person that it's me i know just what to do you know when you're sitting there like i'm not sure what to do i mean really joining the isb board i mean in the grand scheme of all the decisions you will make in your life probably not the biggest one you've ever made but you actually said gosh am i worthy is it, can I contribute? I think that's such a powerful impulse to pay attention to, but not let it paralyze you, I suppose, would be the kind of leadership challenge. Right? A good example, too, is Dr. King, uh, the Montgomery boycott. He had just become the pastor uh, down there, and, and 
he was young, so I think he was like 25, might have been 23, 25, he was very young. So he just went to the meeting and all the older ministers and everything uh, nominated him and put him in the position because <laughs> they, they really didn't want to threaten <laughs> their livelihood and all the things they were doing. So let's get the new, let's get the new kid, you know. Yeah, yeah. We saw like, who wants to be this? And everybody else stepped back and he yeah. was up front. But he, he had no interest, uh, well really he had no desire to be the leader, but they selected him so the obligation fell upon him. Yeah. And he became the rest of history. You know? as it, as, other than being a pastor of the church, that was his first civil rights leadership position. And he had no expectation or interest in when he went to that meeting that he was going to be the leader. Yeah. So, I, you know, that has just struck me since I've had that experience that, you know, the reluctance and how, where, where's the right spot to be, right? If, you're too relu if he had been so reluctant he wouldn't have done it, imagine what history might have done. But on the other hand, if he hadn't been modest enough to not seek the position, could he have ever been as successful, right? So that's, all right, so the next one is, um, sorry, I have to keep putting on my glasses because this is hard to see. It really isn't my eyesight, it's the technology. <laughs> um, so at this point, the way it works is the judge charges the jury, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the judge gave us a lunch break, told us to be back in an hour, and to pick foreman, and it had to be unanimous. And so we have gone back to the jury room, I've been picked, and then everybody went to lunch. And I'm, I'm in panic mode at this point. So see, how, see what you think about this. You gotta get a cookie, yeah, absolutely. And, and so then I went back to the jury room, quickly by myself because I really wanted to think about how was I going to do this? What was I going to do? It's not like they've got a copy of, you know, how to be a jury foreman for dummies sitting there in the jury room. You have no guidance whatsoever as a juror and especially as a foreman. I had to think about where was I going to start? That. So, you know, that kind of builds on the previous point. I mean, have you ever been thrust into this leadership position because someone thinks you're the right person and then you get over your modesty and your reluctance and then you're greeted with the moment of, I don't know a darn thing about this. What, what do I do? Again, someone want to recount an experience like that? This was not your first jury. It was. It yeah. was. My first time I'd ever even <laughs> had to report to be on a jury. So, yeah. I think this behavior that people recognize or, or, or a sense of you know how you hold yourself that others recognize in leadership um, that, that you can apply no matter you know what the circumstance uh, this is not my experience but my son was on a jury when he was 19 and he was like very nervous about it so he started taking notes and the other jurors realized that, thank you, that, that he was taking notes and they're like, they started deferring to him during the, the, the debate after the, the jury was, was done. So he became kind of the, the, the go-to person. It's like, what did they say or what did the prosecutor say when, when this happened? And he was, mm -hmm. based on his behavior, I don't think he was the, the foreman by any, by any means, but he, his behavior, you know, uh, was such that others recognized that he had that information that all of a sudden was, was important. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the experience I would recount, I mean, that, that this, I mean, the, one of the things I told my wife when I got home finally the Friday night after the case was over and I could finally talk to her about it, was that every, almost every experience I'd ever had as a leader came into play in the jury room. And I was able to say, this is like, so uh, one of the um, things that uh, I, I've told people about, I um, have learned, you know, sort of, sort of the hard way that the people in an organization who are on the front lines, especially front line managers, they always know what to do. They always actually know what's going on. 
The higher up you are in an organization, the less you know, if you're honest with yourself, right? By the time you find out something, everyone else knows it, right? <laughs> and I think that that kind of came into play here for me because it was like, all right, it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to, to not be sure, and it's okay to say we're all in this together because that draws people out, you know? Just because, I mean, the, the great mistake so many leaders make is that they somehow think because they've been, they've become the leader, and whatever the methodology is, you know, sometimes it's an application and interview process that can be very arduous, sometimes it's a, a, a very detailed succession plan, sometimes it's completely arbitrary, often it's pure luck, as we've seen, but, the mistake is always to think that somehow because you're sitting in this office or this chair, you're smarter than the people you used to be sitting with or the people who are sitting elsewhere, right? Because you're actually almost certainly less well informed, right? And I think when a leader, what came to my mind during this part was, look, I was only one of 12 people. We had exactly the same experience. We had exactly the same information. We had been together. There was nothing that I knew that they didn't know. So it was kind of easy to see, right? Because I didn't have, like the judge didn't take me aside and say, hey, there's a few things about the case these other people don't know. And since you're the foreman, I'm gonna tell you. That wasn't it at all. So I had no title, I mean, other than being foreman, I mean, I had no real authority in, in the room. I mean, they, I mean, I think some people did want to be a foreman because they didn't want, you know, it's easier not to be, but, and, Again, I think that's a very key principle of leadership is to acknowledge that you have a job, that's actually what you have is a job that is different than the people who aren't in that leadership position, but you need to perform that as well as you are asking them to perform their jobs. You know, and that was the feeling that I had. So let me try this next part. Is this okay? Are you guys yeah, getting bored? Are you right. getting bored yet? Everyone paying it? Some of you have been kind of quiet and you're not going to get away with that much longer. Okay? So. Okay, so this, this does describe a little bit of what I was just talking about. <clears throat> Let me see if I can uh, get it to play in just the right spot. The jury. We'd heard from everyone we were going to hear from and seen all the evidence we were going to see. I told you we were unable to talk about the case all week and how odd that was. But actually I realized it made things less complicated. You don't take positions you can't take back, and you don't ask your fellow jurors what they think. So there have been no disagreements, no arguments, no wounded feelings. Now it was time for all that. Nicholas Benton's fate was in the hands of 12 strangers. When we get back to the jury room, all 11 of them are looking at me. It reminds me of the very first year I coached my son's t-ball team. I walk onto the field carrying the equipment bag, which somehow confers absolute authority on me. All these eyes are turned to me, and all I'm doing is holding the bag, so to speak. I realize then, as I realize now, that the first thing I do will be really important. So the first thing in the jury room, one juror thinks we should close the window shades because the room is so hot. It's July in Atlanta. We can lure them open just enough to let some light in. Another thing is we should turn off the lights and maybe make it a little cooler. I think we're going to have to agree on a bunch of really important, complicated stuff. Let's start off by agreeing about something easy. So I wrote for an agreement that the shades would stay down and the lights would stay on. And that was the case for all of our time in the jury room. Our first unanimous decision. So, another you know, ask what, what do you think about that? I mean, what's your reaction? I see some smiles, so you've been quiet. What do you think? What's going through your head as you're smiling? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's because <laughs> it's been a lot. It's a pleasure just being in the room with so many leaders. <laughs> You know, and, and also to be sitting next to one of my mentors, Emad Clement and Emad Um Two years ago, I would have shied away from being in this setting. <laughs> See, but um, ever since I joined the organization uh, Emad in the City Muslim Action Network, 
we're always on the front line. We're always doing some kind of organizing activities. And for the past two years, that's all I've been involved with, organizing activities. So um, I'm up under the impression is that if you're trained, if you're already trained, and opportunities to be in a leadership position comes up, you know how to handle it and deal with it. And uh, you're absolutely right. Sometimes when we make it to a certain position, oftentimes we forget the grassroots or the training exercise that we went through when we started. So that's why we hire other people to be on the front line, you see. So I'm on the front lines now, so whenever an opportunity does come up to lead, I don't shy away from it, I just accept it. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, I always like, it, 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 the, the fundamentals are unchanged, right? So, other reactions to that? Yes. I mean, I found it interesting that you were, you found so much, you, you were thrust in so much pressure and responsibility, but you handled it in a way where you kind of eased into it, you helped everyone around you ease into it by, like you said, when you made smaller choices, and, and yes, it might have been for some people, maybe it was a, a big deal to have to shade up or down. And, but just to, to, to show them that there is the ability to actually come together and, you know, with reason, try to compromise. And I mean, it's, it, it's the same process, whether it's a small decision or a big decision. And I think you actually helped everybody realize that by, by demonstrating, you know, with the small decisions. Um, and I think that maybe hopefully made it easier going forward with all the larger decisions that you guys had to. It, it certainly did. In fact, one of the things I, you know, that sort of came to me in that moment, and. I could describe some of the jurors and the characters in the room because it was quite a mix and I paid a lot of attention to that and we, we may get into that in a bit. You know, one of the things, the traps you can fall into as a leader, I believe, is you, you, you inevitably as a leader are expected to solve problems, right, uh, fix conflicts, all that stuff. So you can make the mistake of sort of rushing toward the most difficult thing you have to do. Right? What's our first priority? We've got to fix this problem our company's had for 20 years, right? And, and then manager fails, we, we put another person in, they try that, they fail, and it just goes on forever. Well, I think it's always best to find what is the common ground we have, and, and then how much uncommon ground do we really have? And I've often found that if you do that, and I mean this actually on a personal level too, and certainly given <laughs> given where we are and where our society is right now, that would do us a lot of good, right? But we're way more alike than we are different. People agree on more than they disagree on. It's just that there's this necessity and impulse as human beings to go to the places of greatest conflict. It doesn't mean you should avoid them and never deal with them, but as, you know, in this scenario where the, the literal a culture of the jury, like how we're going to operate, which is what I'm going to talk about next, is just emerging. Way better off finding common ground, even if it is as tiny as the shape. I mean, one of the people in the jury room was a retired, um, I think it was a retired architect from Roswell, uh, probably in his 60s, that would be my estimation, maybe even 70. And he was the one who made the suggestion about the lights. And one of the things I sensed, I never asked him and never followed up with him after, uh, I'd asked him, all the jurors for their contact information, and some gave it, some didn't, and some gave some that wasn't accurate. And I just interpreted that as they didn't want to have to talk to me about it. You know, I mean, and I understand that. Um, I ended up getting four of them who, who talked to me at length for over an hour, um, some of whom you may, one of whom you've heard already and others you may hear from. Um, but I had this sense that he was the one who made the suggestion about the lights. And um, it was actually awkward, because we said, all right, well, let's try it. And then someone didn't hear that, and they turned it back on, and we turned it back off. And, but part of it was, he was an architect, and he, he was in part sharing an expertise that he believed he had. And he needed to, I mean, at a very human level, I think, needed someone to say, I get it. You know something about that that can help us. As opposed to the impulse, oh, that's not important. I don't want to work in the dark. It would have created a whole different reaction, right? So I just think that those, those sorts of things are, 
and trying to apply them to the real world. I mean, obviously, we spend our lives in a jury room. That's what I'm trying to do is figure out how do you take that stuff and turn it into universal things that people could practice. All right. Um, I'm just going to let you listen to this one, and then we'll, we'll wrap to it. Here's what I decided to tell my fellow jurors. I've never done this before. I want to go about it in a way I'm familiar with. I tell them we will have some rules of the road, and I ask you to write them on the whiteboard. Let each person finish their point. No interruptions. Raise your hand for the foreman to recognize you before you speak. Occasionally, we will just pull the room to see where we are. Anyone can call for a halt when we just needed a break. I learned this last one during my not exactly glorious high school football career. The officials would gather the team captains before the game. One of the things they tell us is who could call a timeout, whether it was just the team captains or anyone on the field. I decided that because this deliberation was likely to be intense and stressful, anybody on the field could call a timeout. Okay, so I'm going to call Sumaya because she's not getting off the hook here just because uh, uh, she made me come this morning. No, I'm kidding. Um, but what do you see in that, in that part of this, Sumaya? I mean, you work with organizations and their, their culture and their, all those things. You want to meet people where they're at. Right. And try to bring them along because as a leader, you know, something that does not pronounce right. Yeah. Um, and try to bring them from a group. How many, do you guys need two copies of the book? Yeah. No, no, no. Or can you share? Can you share? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, that anyone can call a timeout is uh, very uh, important for me. I work in manufacturing, and when I interviewed with a company, uh, it's a Japanese company, they told me that anyone can stop the manufacturing line if they see uh, a reason for that. And I said, this is ridiculous, uh, stopping a uh, production line for someone. But it is the best thing uh, that, uh, and I still, uh, it is empowering, and um, uh, it gives the team uh, that they are all uh, caring about the quality. They can make that decision. Very important to get the team involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, all right. Um, I, I work in engineering and I oversee inspectors and technicians and the style of writing uh, a report varies with whoever the inspector right. happens to be. Uh, thank you. Sure. Now the client may very well have three or four of my inspectors show up on their project and, and at first blush it may sound unreasonable for them to be reading reports that are stylistically different. And so there's an impulse to uniform the, the uh, reports that the client is getting. And I fight that, and I resist that, and I make sure that I preserve the style of writing and how the inspector is communicating. And I tell them that I'm doing that. I tell them that I'm not going to edit your report to make it look like everybody else's. I'm just going to edit it on its own uh, terms to ensure that that inspector doesn't think that they have to fit into a mold. And, uh, and lose some of their creativity, some of their talent in, in picking out certain things that maybe only them uh, can see. So I, I make that intentional when I communicate that uh, to them. And that is empowering as a uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. What I was after at that point in the jury room without completely recognizing it at the time was that I was trying to make the first steps toward establishing the culture of our group. You know. And part of that was, like you can say, well, I want to respect everyone's opinion and their way of communicating and their way of talking about what's most important to them, right? But if you don't do like what you did, you're doing. Like, you can say that all you want, but the first time you change someone's report, they don't believe you, right? So saying that we are going to not interrupt each other, that didn't work out entirely, by the way, as you might imagine. But that what I was really trying to say was everyone has a voice here. Everyone can stop the production line. 
all of our opinions are important because of how important this decision is that we have to make. And to me, that's the, li the literal microcosm of the struggle and the importance in every organization to create a culture. Because you can have lots of mission statements on the walls and vision statements, you can do lots of training, but how do you actually behave? That's where people get their clues. And when I would tell someone, sorry, but this person's talking now in that room, which is hard to do, as, as, you, as we all know, it mattered. And, and to me, that was one of the more valuable you know, impulses that I had. I, you notice I'm not showing you any of the things I really screwed up. We can, that's for another Saturday night. <laughs> that session will be at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. <laughs> so, all right, I have one more part um, that I, I want to play, and, um, and then that'll be the end of you listening to me talk, but I'm really interested in your reaction to this, uh, this part of it for me. It's, if I can just get it to the right starting point. This is a little sooner than I need, so. Kill Bridget Koiku and Fat Bush. Many of the jurors wanted to take a vote right away. They're anxious to talk, but I see peril in that. I've worked in newsrooms for a long time and seen many complicated stories debated. If you let someone state their position right away, before the issue is deeply explored, the impulse will be to defend it at all costs, rather than arriving at the truth or the answer. At this moment, I need to lead, to assert clear direction without being too obvious about it. So we don't take an up or down, guilty or not guilty, though. To the jurors, I said, let's go around the room and have each person talk about what questions they have about the case. But don't bring in people who aren't involved or evidence we haven't heard. That will only confuse an already confused set of circumstances. This was a useful exercise. Those questions help us to figure out what our biggest concerns were, and that shaped our deliberations. Reactions to that? I mean, you've all been, I mean, we only have a couple people without books. So I'm looking <laughs> back there. You know, we've all been part of really hard decisions big debates. Well, when they go wrong, why do they go wrong? How about let's try that, or whatever you were planning to say is fine. You no, know, I was just going to say that in the leadership position, the role of leadership, it's collective and they have to be shared. And, and the sense is the leadership is in the hands of the resourceful people and you have to search for them, you have to listen to them, you have to see whether you have to work with them. Uh, because even though the head is the leader, it's still part of the body. Right. Others? Uh, well, wait, we have someone who hasn't participated yet. It's okay, no, please, please. No, I, I was just going to say that um, this is all making, this is all making, this is all making very enjoyable. Um, but it, what it's made me realize is that any leadership curriculum must have behavioral psychology. I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Any, any leadership curriculum must involve behavioral psychology. <laughs> like just learning. My wife said social psychology. She has a psychology degree when I described it. But go ahead, you're, I think you're absolutely so, right. So just, you know, for, I'm an ophthalmologist. For the last 10 years, I've, been practice, I've always practiced kind of in an inner city, you know, situation. But, but recently I joined a practice that's in a more affluent area. Mm -hmm. So now I have to deal with these people who are very, um, High maintenance, and it's a whole other, it's a whole other discipline. Like I, yeah. I have to really change the way that I think and the way that I talk to them, and they want to be more involved. I'm used to being like, "Oh, doctor, just tell us what's happening. What kind of surgery do I need? What do I?" Yeah. But these people want to know every single option there is, and how much this is going to be, and how much. And you know, it goes back to like having a good team. So I, I don't like talking to my patients about money. It just I want their, there's a financial counselor, there's, you know. Yeah. But um, behavioral psychology or social psychology, this is so important. Yeah. We need to, yeah, and what you're saying, like, you know, there's, there's more common ground than there is. So we need to take advantage of that as, as human beings. And yeah, I, 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 I think you're exactly right. But this is, what I, this is what you did, you know, through your process. Like I said, all the things I screwed up are not. <laughs> 
Yes. Um, in, um, in management, we always say uh, focus on the situation rather than on the person. And I think by, um, by saying that uh, we will not, because once I say uh, that I think he's guilty or he's innocent, I am enriched and I will be defending my opinion. Uh, by asking them to ask the questions, what they are lacking, or maybe it's not very clear in their mind, uh, you are forcing them to think about the situation and take the personality out of it. Right. No, I, I agree more. I hope this made you feel good about the justice system. I know that you work with in a different part of it, but. <laughs> well, what? No, it's, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I just, I, it's just reminding me of a book I'm reading where we're trying to understand basically how, how our countries become so divided. And I think um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I think we didn't realize, I think, until it got to a point where it got really, really bad. Um, and, uh, but, we, but I think it's important to understand not just the psychology of a human, but the fact that we really all behave in the same way, like, mm -hmm. if you really think about it. So when you start defending somebody's opinion, they, they associate that opinion with themselves and their identity, but you have to separate that from that person, because if, just because I believe something doesn't mean that's who I am, so if you attack what I believe, it doesn't, doesn't attack me as a person, and so I think that's really hard for people to, to do, and so we have to understand that this is a natural reaction that people are going to have. So when we start to, to say, well, I'm not actually attacking you, I'm just telling you that your ideas are wrong, that's, that's not going to work if you say that. <laughs> but that, people are just going to be defensive no matter what. So you, when you said that everybody just brought up their ideas and without having formed that opinion, um, you know, before even associating it with this is what I think, you know, is the truth. I think that's a really critical because you separate that, that um, you know, that person's identity with, with the ideas that are maybe being brainstormed. And so that when you start discussing them, you're not attacking them necessarily. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was trying to avoid. Yeah, um, certainly judges and justice administrators have had numerous discussions, I'm sure, about do we train foremans or do we give foremans any <laughs> advice or anything else? And so they've come to the conclusion of no, we don't, because basically uh, I, I think they want to just throw you in there so that you will be obligated to build consensus. You know, it's, and it's several ways to build consensus. It's a hard way, it's an easy way. It's a, so the easy way is to, the way you're doing it is to get everybody to buy in, everybody to establish, uh, you know, who they are and, and, and how they are seeing things. Uh, but we are always taught that the worst way to build consensus for a leader is for a leader to come in and say what his position is and what he thinks and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody, half the people just buy into what the leader says, and the other half just go quiet or whatever. But that's that's not real consensus. So uh, it, and so you're dealing with each person as a leader, and and getting them rather than taking their position, let them uh, share what they haven't quite understood or what what they want to know, and then that information is going to come from somebody else. Uh, and it's, it's going to be that consensus process where everybody has equal buy-in, and, and that's the easiest way. Uh, and so I've, I'm sure that uh, judges and, and administrators have had this discussion, and they say, well, hey, let's just trust the people, and they'll work it out. That's right, yeah. I draw a parallel from uh, your discussion and presentation uh, between taking, uh, like, a physician who takes the history from a patient and uh, the patient starts talking and uh, he's here for your blood sugar and then he starts talking about the grandfather, how he was visiting him, the grandfather. And you have to come to a point where you want to cut all the chase and you to come to the point. And the quality of a leader, I think, would be to extract from that particular individual or in this case, the group of people that he's leading, the essence of their statement without offending them. In other words, uh, I sense that uh, from your uh, thing that there was a point where people digress a lot and uh, the, the limitation of time and the, the limitation of all the other in consideration of other people, the art and perhaps the quality of the leader would be to extract the important and separate the important from the unimportant one like that uh, 
I took that and drew a parallel uh, from that into my own practice, mm -hmm. the way we talk and deal with the patients. Right, I think part of it was sort of recognizing the needs that different people had. I mean, if we were a jury, and there are a little bit more than 12 of us, or actually 13, because one's an alternate, but the alternate doesn't know. They have to sit through the whole trial, mm -hmm. and then they, they get told to leave. But, um, but part of it is um, people have different needs, right? Like, for example, in this trial, there was testimony from witnesses, there was physical evidence, bullets, things like that, and then there were videos. And one of the things I noticed is that some people had a need, like we went back out in the courtroom and requested to see the videos again, even though not everybody really wanted to do that. But there were several people, that was the way, they were really trying to understand what was going on. Other people never really looked at the physical, you know, they bring a box in and you kind of look at the bullet. I mean, I looked at it because I have morbid fascination and I'm not proud of that, but it's true. Um, but other people didn't want to touch it. You know, and so you have you have these different needs. I would tell you the other thing, um, and we're almost done here. The the other thing that I'm not sure what to do with this, and so that's kind of why it's not in this uh, presentation yet. One of the most fascinating things to me about being in a jury room is how everybody in that situation has to own their opinion ultimately, because you're going to vote, and every per I mean, it only takes one person to not agree, right? Um, so, you know, I know you've all been through this, or you've overheard this, or you have, I mean, you know, you go have dinner with someone, or meet someone for coffee or something, and, and they're going off about, oh, you know, they ought to do this, and they ought to do that. And we have so many people doing that, especially in the media, who don't have to live with their opinion. In other words, they can kind of do it, and then it's over with. In the jury room, you have, there is no way out of the ultimate decision. None whatsoever. So to me, it's like a fascinating, true reality show, right? We are sending this guy to prison for life or not. What do you say? Yes or no? Well, I'd like to think about it. No. It's yes or no. I mean, that's a very, that was a very powerful experience for me. So the way the experience concluded, this is the literal verdict sheet that as the foreman I had to fill out and sign with my name on it and read aloud in the courtroom. I went out there and, and as you know, I mean, I've given all kinds of speeches. I've, I've had talks like this with small groups. I've been the graduation speaker at Georgia Tech. I've been before extremely hostile crowds. I've never been more nervous because I knew that that defendant, the families of the, of the victims were all sitting there and at the moment they heard guilty or not guilty, their lives were changed forever. And that's, a, that's another, to be that accountable for your decisions is actually kind of a rare thing in life. It really is. As much as we like to think we're accountable, we often aren't. And so, so, so all the guilty, all the guilty votes is unanimous and all the not, not guilty. Okay. You're asking what you think is a simple question, and it should be, but here's what actually happened in the jury room. This really happened, and I, this is one of my uh, several failures as the foreman. So I thought that when we went, got in the jury room, but we had a woman who'd been on a jury previously. She was one of only two people in the room who'd ever been on a jury, and she was insistent that we had to be unanimous whether we said guilty or not guilty. So if we were gonna not convict on a charge, we had to all agree on not guilty. In fact, as I think most of you probably know, it only takes one person to be hung on one charge, and then that charge they're not guilty of, but you, not the whole jury verdict isn't hung. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm not sure what to do. So they have a deputy who comes in and out and deals with the jury's knees and stuff, and so I asked him, like, hey, could you, and he just kind of looked at me like, I can't answer that question. So then, when you ask the judge a question, you have to write it out and sign it and everything. And I started writing it out, and I'm like, look, I'm an editor, and this question makes no sense to me, you know? So what I decided to do was see if we could be unanimous on all the charges, guilty or not guilty. And if we couldn't, then ask the question. So the way, and we were able to do it. We all agreed not guilty on the charges where he was not guilty, and we all agreed guilty on the charges where he was. Um, but it was, you know, it was a tough process. I, I think in its way kind of good because we got, everyone got there, worked together, 
and we, we came out of that jury room in, in complete agreement on everything. But in reality, the, the not guilty is not unanimous. That doesn't have to, doesn't your have, word, but it doesn't doesn't have, have to be, right. But in our case, it was. But, so yes. So I, I served a jury, I think it was in 2014 or 15, and it was, it was a serious case of uh, battery and, and, and other charges. And to your earlier point of owning your decision, um, what I felt made things easier, you know, all things considered, uh, and, and also I think what makes it universal is to understand the context. In other words, yes, I am responsible, and, and to add uh, insult to injury, it was a minimum sentencing requirement on that. So if we found him guilty, he would go away for 10 years or 12 years. Although you know, I'm sure, as a juror, you're not supposed to consider punishment in exactly. your decision. Correct. Right? Correct. But I think that's, I understand why the law is that way. I think it's completely unrealistic. Right. I mean, you're not a human being if you're not thinking about that. But, but, but the idea is I've been conscripted to serve on that jury, and I needed to understand what my role was. And my role was to arbitrate, so to speak, in my own mind, that this charge applies or not. That's, that's it. Uh, so if I discharge that duty faithfully and correctly, it gave me some comfort, at least while I'm there. Later on, you might reflect on it and feel sorry for the person that maybe another uh, sentence might have befitted the crime. But the context is, I'm, I'm neither a legislator, I'm, I'm not the judge, I'm certainly not the prosecutor or the attorney. I'm there as a juror. And, and so what I think is universal to that is if you understand the context, it makes your ability to do, do your job a whole lot better than just to be there given the esoteric uh, you know, duty without necessarily understanding where you fit within the overall Right, program. you have a very specific job to do. Yeah. And if you accept that and do the job, it, it is a lot easier. But as I'm sure you experienced, certainly I did, that is not easy okay. for no any of us, actually, no under the circumstances. Because in this case, that comment about let's consider the evidence that we've been presented, I mean, you had hints that maybe there was a gang thing here, all this, and, and so people got, real interested in that. In the video, there's this other car that you see and everything, and we had to say, we've got the evidence we were presented. That is where, that's, from a media point of view, that's what's, why covering trials is so interesting. Because the jury does not hear everything that we report to the public, right? Because when a motion's made before the judge and the jury's out of the room and all that kind of stuff. So there were things in this trial that I found out later that we didn't know anything about. but. You have that one job, you know, because a lot of things enter into this. I mean, you know, depending on your point of view, you got four African Americans, you know, you know, this guy went to prison for life. I mean, one of the things I think about and talk about in the podcast, the guy we convicted is in prison for life. He did get the possibility of parole, so after 30 years, he could possibly be paroled. He's the same age as my eldest daughter. And he will be in prison until he's older than I am. And I put him in. I mean, I just think about all the things that have happened in my life in that period. And he will be in prison that whole time. And is that, I mean, how do you feel good about that? I don't. I'm, I, I understand the justice system. I understand how these victims must have felt. I mean, the mother of one of the victims came afterward when we went to the sentencing, another a couple of the other jurors were there, and and after the sentencing, hugged one of the jurors and thanked, them. and and it is such a like difficult thing because I don't feel good about sending someone to prison like that, but I had the job that was the job to do and to come to the best possible decision. So I will leave you with that. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So, And there's plenty of food and coffee, right, if we want to come for it. So, thank okay, you so much. Let me just ask, uh, how, many, how many of us have been on a jury? I, I mean, hey, yes, how many of us have been on a jury? I've been on a grand jury. You've been on a oh, grand jury. Grand jury. Which is four, four weeks. A couple yeah, weeks. that's a longer duty, but in some ways. They are indictments, and I learned I know, all the sir, places that the motor driver, drugs are sold, uh, Rupert Memorial, and all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to encourage you to listen to this podcast. If you thought I was interesting, it's way more interesting than, yeah. than I was. Well, my guess is, because from my personal experience, I've, I've been summoned 
uh, probably six or seven times, but always turn it down. So my guess is that most Muslims are turned down just uh, for various reasons. I mean, I think under the law, that can't be a reason. Yeah, I know, I know. Right, and then death penalty cases are more complicated too because you are, you are excused if you say you uh, have a religious reason for opposing death penalty or something like that. But there would not be a reason that someone who's Muslim wouldn't be on the jury. It would be wrong, in fact, to be excluded yeah, for that reason. Yeah, so. yeah. and so mine, mine comes, from, which sort of skirts the uh, mine comes from uh, being a minister. Right. Right. And the journalists used to never be able to get on. Right. That, I'm, so, so I'm surprised that they wouldn't got you amazing, on the jury. Wouldn't it be amazing if you get picked for a jury like in the coming weeks? <laughs> Actually, I got a summons. I got another summons that had to call in Wednesday night and thought I might have to report Thursday morning, but I didn't. So. Oh, wow. yes. yes. Do you remember the name of the defense attorney? I'm sorry? The defense attorney, do you remember who? Uh, Gerald Briggs. Okay. I thought it would be a few. No. I thought he was, I would tell you a couple things about him. I thought he did an excellent job. And he also was extremely helpful with the podcast. He sat down with us for over an hour, and he's a big part of the podcast. And some of his points of view about things, particularly around jury service, were tremendously insightful. I, I you know, and um, the, one of the most interesting characters in the podcast is the lead homicide detective. He's just a cop's cop, and the way he describes what went on and how he investigated it and all that's really, really interesting. So Maya, listen, you listen to, to it, again. so she can, I'm, I'm trying to get her to go on iTunes and give it rave reviews, but she hasn't done that. Yet. <laughs> yes? Did Gerald Briggs talk about bad forms, bad jury forms? It's obviously you, he you, talked a lot cool. about people trying to avoid jury service and what a mistake that is, that it is one of the most in, single most important aspects of the American, the, sort of the citizen, part of being a citizen in America, because the jury system, which we have chosen, uh, you know, that when we have legal disputes in our country, it will be a jury of your peers who, that will decide that, rather than a king or a, an appointed official, and how crucial that is. And then, our legal affairs reporter, Bill, makes the point that, think about it this way. If you found yourself in that circumstance somehow, wouldn't you want someone like you on your jury? Mm -hmm. I know I would, so. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, yeah, it was great. Yeah. If anybody didn't get a book, I do have a couple more, and I don't want to have to drag them around, so.